Equipment is a massive part of a videographer's job. You need to know what to buy, how to use it, store it, transport it, and integrate it into your workflow. What's up guys, my name is Carlos Cortesi, CEO of Cortesi Productions, and on this video, we will cover 10 tips to get the most out of your videography equipment. Let's get started. Tip number one is to master manual settings. Can you film using auto settings? Yes, but you're selling yourself short. Manual settings are crucial for videography. It's like learning grammar to write a novel or music theory to play guitar. Do you want lots of motion blur or a warmer image? Is your shot too green? Do you want the blurry background? Is your subject constantly out of focus? These are all things you can manipulate using your camera's manual settings. Take the time to learn and understand how your aperture, shutter speed, ISO, white balance, tint, frame rate, color profile, resolution, bit depth, and bit rate affect your image. This is one of the main things that separates the amateur from the professional look. When filming a project, things can change fast. You might be filming a talking head outside and then film B-roll indoors, and then outside again to capture a VIP, and then back inside for another interview. So you need to be fast and accurate in adapting to the different lighting conditions while still retaining a gorgeous image. In order to do that, you need a ton of practice. Learning manual settings on YouTube is not enough. This is a skill, which means you need to do hundreds of reps until it's as natural as walking. Tip number two is to get a dedicated cinema camera. Modern mirrorless cameras are great. However, for higher end corporate projects, I think a cinema camera is superior due to extra features like internal NDs, which greatly speed up and simplify setting exposure, time code to sync audio and other cameras, better and less compressed codecs for easier color grading and editing, more audio options, which allow for XLR microphones and backup tracks, more monitoring options like SDI and full-size HDMI ports, dual proxy recording to save you time editing, increased modularity for different project types, more buttons and better video ergonomics, better exposure tools like false color and internal fans to avoid overheating. Remember, most mirrorless cameras are designed for photos, so there are features you might be giving up. Even the Canon R5C, which was marketed as a cinema and photo camera, lacks many essential specs from Canon cinema lineup. So, for higher end project work, consider getting a dedicated cinema camera. I personally recommend Canon due to its internal RAW, out of camera colors, and amazing customer and repair service. Tip number three is to invest in your editing system. The greatest bottleneck in video production is editing. You could land dozens of clients and film twice as many projects, but editing might take most of the time in the production process. It's the constraint that creates a backlog, so no matter how much you film, your final output or finished videos will always be limited by the editing process, making it the bottleneck of the system. So, in order to open up that bottleneck, getting a powerful editing computer is crucial. A beefed up machine will allow you to edit faster with smoother playback, faster exports, and no need for proxies. Now, computer specs are a rabbit hole I don't have the expertise to go down, so I'll just tell you what I have. Disclaimer, currently I only edit on PC, so if you want to learn about Apple systems, you'll need to go somewhere else. Also, I will only be covering performance for Adobe's Premiere Pro. I edit mostly 10-bit XFABC and 12-bit RAW 4K files. So in 2021, I bought a Lenovo P340 for $2,000 with the following specs. When buying a computer, try to be at or above Adobe's recommended spec list for Premiere Pro. Adobe also recommends to have a CPU of 3.2 gigahertz or higher and states that eight cores will have Premiere running at 93 to 98% efficiency. But what about building a computer? Unless you have experience or a ton of time to learn, I wouldn't suggest building your main editing computer if it's your first time. When deadlines are looming and clients are waiting, technical issues are a stress I don't need. Not to mention the difficulty in sourcing certain parts. Also, since builds are usually made from a conglomerate of brands, getting support and warranty if something goes wrong might be difficult. But buying or building a supercomputer might not be enough. The drive you're editing on is just as important as the machine. For the best performance, you want to get a PCIe NVMe drive that connects directly to your computer's motherboard. This will be much faster than even an external or SATA SSD and worlds faster than internal or external HDDs. Do your research and find out what's best for your budget, but investing in a solid editing system is a great way to increase your production capacity. Tip number four is to invest in quality production gear. Yes. I know video gear is expensive, but I don't think you should sell a kidney or max out your credit card to get it. I try to buy gear as I need it, and needing it means earning it with revenue from previous projects. 
If a film calls for specialized gear and you can't afford it, consider renting it to avoid the upfront cost. Hopefully, the project will earn you more business and you can eventually afford it. For example, if you do speaker reels and need a 70 to 200 millimeter telephoto because the subject is far into the stage, don't go for the F4 just because it's half the price. Speaker events are often dimly lit to highlight the presentation screen, so buying the F4 will mean higher ISO, resulting in a grainier image and subpar quality. Spend a little extra and go for the F2.8 instead, because if you're going to spend anyways, you might as well do it right and get the full benefit. Another example was when I bought my Easy Rig. I put off buying it for a while, but after constant back knots and shaky footage due to fatigue, I bit the bullet and picked one up. And wow, what a difference. The camera was now weightless, no more painful back, and I saved tons of time on set and in editing because every shot was so much smoother. In regards to the equipment, everyone's situation is different. Maybe you're filming mostly interviews and don't need high frame rates, or you might do mostly highlights and have no need for an extensive audio kit. It's all mission dependent. Also, remember there are two categories of production gear, project focused and efficiency focused. Project focused gear is equipment that objectively gives you a better image or sound. This includes cameras, lenses, filters, lights, stabilizers, recorders, or microphones. Efficiency focused gear is equipment that makes your life easier on set and in pose, but does not necessarily translate to a better video. Some examples include tripods, editing computers, production cards, cases, monitors, and many other auxiliary items that increase your efficiency. Many people focus mainly on project gear and neglect efficiency gear. I think the smoother, faster, and more enjoyable it is to film, the better work you produce. Don't shy away from buying gear just because it does not directly translate to a better video. Tip number five is to learn everything about your equipment. You can have the nicest gear and be a technical Zen master, but if you don't know how to use your camera, you are toast. Even cameras from the same brand can vary greatly in their layout, and the last place you want to hastily search for these is on a pit project. When I bought my Canon C70, the first thing I did was buy Rubidium C70 Mastery course to learn everything there was to know about the camera before I stepped on set. I know it might seem daunting, but it is necessary. From filming an interview in 24 frames to quickly switching to B-roll at 60 frames and then back to interviews at 24, you need to be quick and adaptable when changing settings. The first time you use your camera or a new feature should never be with a client. I'd rather spend hours training than one second regretting a technical mistake on a project. Tip number six is to have an efficient and robust way to carry your gear. How you transport your equipment will have a huge impact in your production process. I tried to make gear easy to transport while protecting it from bumps and falls. So I used the Pelican 1510 as my main production case, a Think Tank backpack for my BTS camera, headphones and other accessories, an SKB case for my audio system, an LSB 6500 bag for poles and modifiers, and I carry it all on a Gator 52-inch utility cart, which can be outfitted with amazing accessories to make it feel like an innovative cart. I also put locks on my main camera cases and air tags on the expensive and rare gear items in case I lose sight of them. However, no matter how effective your transportation system is, keep in mind that at some point you will need an assistant to help you with your gear. You'll know when that time has come. Tip number seven is to have a robust backup system. You never know when you might need previous footage. You can sell it, use it for marketing, YouTube videos like this one, internal trainings, or anything else you can think of. But storing these files is not cheap, especially as you record in higher resolutions and data rates. At first, I bought large HDD drives to store finished projects. However, I had to keep buying more to keep up with the new data. It was also frustrating to have different projects on separate drives, as accessing them meant looking for the physical drive since I didn't have enough desk space to have them by my computer. Also, one of my game drives started failing and will occasionally not let me access the files. So after some research, I upgraded to a Synology NAS system. It wasn't cheap, but the difference was astronomical. NAS stands for Network Access Storage, and is a computer server that you can install different drives to and then access them remotely via internet, making it your own private server. I bought the DS1522 Plus, which allowed me to put five 12 terabyte drives and take advantage of the Synology RAID storage system, which partitions the data across different drives to protect against failure from an individual drive. However, keep in mind this will lower the total storage of the system. Visit the Synology page to calculate your RAID space and learn about the different types of RAID to see which one is best for you. 
the Synology NAS gave me considerable advantages over my previous system. It allowed me to have all my projects in one drive so I didn't have to constantly switch between hard drives to access data. It provided me with the security of a RAID system in case of a drive failure. It has software to track health and performance of each drive. It provides expansion options to daisy chain as many systems as you want for virtually unlimited storage as your business grows. It boasts an impressive suite of apps that allow you to optimize and customize your storage needs, like setting up cloud backups or backups to another USB device. And it acts as your own private server, which means that with the username and password, you can access all your files from anywhere in the world. So if you're working on a project in your laptop away from the studio, all you need to do is log in and access your NAS at home. This can also be very helpful for remote editors that need to access the source files in your NAS, and you can customize their access for security purposes. Again, I'm not an expert on storage or NAS systems. If you want to learn more, I suggest you visit SpaceRex's channel as he specializes in Synology NAS and has a ton of tips that help me out. So don't risk your data, get a robust backup system for your files. Tip number eight is to have an audio system. I'm not an audio expert, but here's what has been working for me these past couple years. I carry the Rode Wireless Go, which is my most used mic in running gun conference and events. For interviews, I have the NTG4, and I recently bought the NTG3, which I use as a boom mic. And then a Rode Video Mic Pro on the B-Cam to make for easier syncing in post. I also carry a set of XLR cables, stands, a boom pole, which I just recently bought, and a Zoom H6 recorder. This thing is amazing. It records dot .wave files up to four channels at a time, and I use it extensively in corporate events to plug into the mixing board and get a clean audio straight from the board. If there is no mixing board or the sound dude is MIA, I simply prop up a boom microphone on a stand in front of the speaker, set the appropriate levels, and leave it on record for the entire event. Never be caught without an audio system. Tip number nine is to make a charging station. Jake Weisler shared this in a video once, and I thought it was brilliant. He made a charging station to consolidate the dozens of batteries and chargers that videographers deal with. Now, he went all out. He bought a metal frame, hung it on his wall, put some baskets, and it looked amazing. Make sure to check out his video for more information. Since I'm in a rental apartment, I'd rather not dig holes in the wall. So I went with a simpler and faster setup, consisting of an Amazon power strip hooked up to an extension lying flat on my work desk. There are a ton of ways to go about it, but the main idea is to have all your outlets in one spot to make it easier to track batteries and not leave anything behind. And finally, tip number 10 is to have equipment backups. Two is one and one is none. I personally have a backup of nearly everything. I have multiple cameras, lenses, tripods, lights, computers, a portable jump starter for my car, guitars, shoes, cars, friends, everything. I know videographers that only film with one camera. Madness. If a mission dependent item fails and you don't have a backup, you are fried. Story time. Earlier this year, we had a project booked in Brandon, South Dakota, and another event in Miami, Florida, the following day at 6 p.m. No problem. We bought the flight to arrive late at night from South Dakota, which gave us time to sleep and prep for the next day for the project at six. However, in a very rare move, American Airlines delayed our flight. We missed our layover from Texas to Miami and had to spend the night in Dallas. After more delays the next day, we ended up landing in Miami at 5.45 p.m. The plane is touching down, the client is rushing us, we're sprinting through the airport and had to leave our check bags in baggage claim because there was no time to wait for the luggage. Luckily, we had all our cameras, lenses, and audio gear as carry-on, but my sat sort of tripod was left behind. Even worse, the project had a two-hour continuous speech portion with interviews, so there was no way we were going to pull that off handheld. Luckily, I had a backup, a $150 K-Year tripod stuffed in my car that saved our butts in the production. So I'm a huge proponent of having backups. The nice thing is that sometimes backups create themselves. When you upgrade to new gear, try not to sell the old gear unless you really need the money. That way you always have both in case of failure. That's it guys, hope these 10 tips help you in your videography journey. If you have any questions, feel free to comment down below. And if you want more awesome videography content, make sure to subscribe. Peace.